What's up fellow gamers, Freak here, and the new Path of Exile League is coming. I'm excited, I'm going to League start on Friday morning, hopefully you all do too. This is going to be my third, I think, video on what you should be League starting. Um, it is very nerdy, it is very spreadsheety, and because I added more content to this, um, I ended up doing less work on presentation. Uh, sorry about that, but there is a limit to the amount of uh, effort I'm willing to put into YouTube videos because I'm not a full-time content creator. Okay, let's talk about what you should be doing with this one and what this video is, for those who don't know. Um, this is using the week one snapshot of Calandra Softcore SSF and using that to try to extrapolate what we might want to play, what we should play, what is being played. There are a bunch of caveats with this. So, so data doesn't lie, but people lie when they like try to interpret data poorly. And I'm going to somewhat intentionally interpret data poorly in this video because doing it correctly requires way more work than I want to put in. Um, of course, patch notes are already out. We know that abilities like Lightning Strike and Lightning Conduit and Spectral Helix all got nerfed. Uh, you can see that um, three of the four most popular abilities <laughs> are some of those abilities, right? So, um, look, it's... Okay, latest strikes over here, to be fair. It's off the screen, but trust me, it's in there. Anyway, let's talk about caveats in data real quick, and then we'll move on to the actual analysis itself as we just look at this screen. If you want to skip forward, obviously feel free. There should be timestamps in the description below, or you can just click on the, the little YouTube bar. Okay, so what we're actually measuring factually is what happened a few months ago in the Lake of Calandra expansion, where at one week, who were the highest level skills at five links and higher? So a few things could happen here, right? So number one, um, skills could fail to be five linked from level 80 onwards. We're starting our analysis at level 80. That seems pretty solidly into late whites, early yellows, I feel like, maybe mid, mid yellows, um, depending on, I don't know how much you're clearing or whatnot, but ultimately, um, we're giving one week, which gives around eight players the chance to get level 100, which I think is actually pretty good. You get a handful of people who've already raced all the way up there. It means that you had the option of hitting 100. Um, there's all kinds of biases available in terms of um, what kinds of players play things. Like It could be that players who play more every day or play more days in the week tend to play melee or tend to play ranged or tend to play minions, and that you have kind of a player-based skew. And if you're only measuring just pure XP per hour, but not XP per hour logged in, XP per hour in the real world, that can skew based on, oh, actually, melee players tend to be more hardcore. That's possible, right? And so you might see melee skills overperform a one-week snapshot because we're not saying, hey, what's 80 hours in game? We're saying, hey, what's 100-something hours in real life, right? Um, so that's a possible bias. Another possible bias that I'm trying to account for a little bit uh, later on in the data we'll get to is um, if players are switching a build off partway through. So, for example, if you're going to League Start Righteous Fire, but around level 95, you're like, actually, I'm switching to Spark. Then you can see a huge drop in Righteous Fire and a huge spike in Spark late game, where um, functionally, we would, um, we would basically never see a level 96 Righteous Fire player. They're already a Spark player. But if they haven't done it yet... You know, like the, the, a similar player who plays fewer hours is a level 91 Righteous Fire player. So you'll see level 96 Sparks, but you won't see 96 Righteous Fires, but you'll see 90 Righteous Fires, but you won't see 90 Sparks. Which means the, the, like, the graph of what level our Spark players on average changes wildly, right? That is a possibility that, oh, I've farmed enough currency after one week, I switched my build, I didn't catch that on the snapshot, right? I'm not tracking builds day by day to see, ah, well, this player switched to Spark on day six. I'm not doing any of that, right? So that's a possible bias, that players change their skills and just doing a day seven snapshot, you know, we'll never see them on their way up, but only sees them post conversion and it inflates other abilities. That's of course possible. Um, all kinds of things around like, oh, I play Righteous Fire just as my example to get level 93 to, ooh, I, you know, it's my league starter, but I found a six link and so I hopped off, right? Righteous Fire might be a very good league starter, but if no one goes to 94 because they found the first crop of six link and said, oh, time to make Cyclone, uh, because the colors are correct, like, they suddenly stopped leveling Righteous Fire, and now suddenly Cyclone is on the mix, right? So there's all kinds of possibilities of um, these graphs can show, these charts can show, this data could show the idea that a character isn't good at pushing late reds 
because they stop showing up in level 96 and 97, 98, 99, 100. But really, they were good at that, but the player switched out, right? So that's one possible bias here as well. Anyway, there's a lot more that can happen. I want to come, uh, talk about a couple more things with the data, and then we'll move on to the actual analysis itself, or at least the regurgitation of data itself. So we tracked level 80 through 100. I manually wrote down how many of each of these skills uh, had a five link or better uh, via uh, poe.ninja and use that as the primary analysis. It's worth noting that only about 70% of this 9,359 characters who were level 80 in uh, Kalandra SSF softcore um, at week one, um, of this 9,359 characters, um, one of them was unascended. <laughs> so we have one just, you know, ranger running around. I don't actually know what, what class it was, uh, running around uh, Ray class or Orioth. Um, um, even though I grabbed every skill that had, I think, like at least 0.9% of the latter. Um, so there are some skills who were even less popular that I'm just simply not grabbing in this uh, analysis. And also plenty of players who were just on a four link Righteous Fire. That They were a level 84 Righteous Fire character, but it was Righteous Fire on a four link. They had not gotten a five link yet in solo self-found soft core. So that is certainly a possibility. If we scroll down to a second version of the analysis where we basically did, okay, but percent of the captured characters, right? Right, we, we, we tracked sort of, there was a baseline 9,300 characters who hit level 80, but we're only tracking 6,539 of them who were level 80 uh, and had a five link or better in one of these skills. Um, this is gonna be kind of the primary analysis that I'm, I am cutting out all these characters that were like, running other abilities. I think like Cyclone, for example, is not here. I think like Holy Flame Totem, Armageddon Brand, um, you know, Fire Burst, um, Six Link Flame Wall, like any of those, like those builds aren't in the analysis. Uh, Six Link Fire Trap is not in the analysis. That was going to be your primary skill, not Righteous Fire. Like all those uh, don't exist um, in this analysis. And so to try to keep things fair because of the bias of people getting Six Links that hit level 90, but or Five Links that hit 90, but don't have them at 80 yet, Instead, this data is all in relation to this cohort of players, which um, if you don't do this, basically, you just see every graph goes up and to the right because, you know, a level 80 Red Fire character might have been on a four link, a level 90 Red Fire character is on a five link, and it shows like a population growing up when it when it doesn't actually, right? It's That's the same character at a different point in time, functionally. Um, okay, so let's talk about what the actual data tells us. Hopefully that made some degree of sense. TLDR, welcome back, everyone. We're going to talk about which builds tended to overperform expectations. If we assume that every skill is equally strong, that means an equal percentage of players are going to have a five link at level 80. You know, if like Lightning Condo is twice as popular as Righteous Fire or Blade Vortex, you know, it's going to be like 20% of the ladder is Lightning Conduit and 10% of the ladder is Blade Vortex. And then you go on and it's like, well, what about at level 90? It would still be 20% and 10% at level 95, 20% and 10%. And anywhere that that moves, that's going to mean possibly with bias, not exactly. It might mean that that skill is way better at pushing red maps and functionally getting more XP per hour, filling out your Atlas and jamming through currency because just clearing maps in the first week of the league is probably the best way to get stuff done, probably the best way to get more power. This is not necessarily boss DPS, it's really map clear speed. And in one point though, is it's map clear speed with deaths rolled in. Yes, we're playing soft core, but dying sends you back several maps. And so there is an innate amount of tankiness built in. Again, we're functionally just measuring XP per hour. Um, and these characters are getting into the late 90s in many cases. So. The most popular build, unsurprisingly, in the first week of SSF Softcore Calandra was Lightning Conduit. And Lightning Conduit tended to fall off over the course of time. Now, this could easily be players abandoning a skill that they weren't really enjoying. That, you know, they got to 90 with Lightning Conduit and go, you know what? I got my fill. I'm going to play a different skill. Maybe they couldn't find ways to scale it. Maybe they choose to switch out to playing a different skill. Lots of possibilities. Or it could be the Lightning Conduit really did not quite scale as hard, at least in an SSF scenario. Maybe in trade that would change. But um, for the most part, Lightning Conduit players seemed to not try too hard to stick with it. Worth noting that the vast majority of Lightning Conduit players were Elementalists. Also worth noting that Lightning Conduit is getting, I believe, about a 30% damage nerf in the patch. So maybe people figured out how to put the late game of this, uh, of this character correctly down the line. But the data seems to indicate people were hopping off of Lightning Conduit or at least weren't, on average, sticking out sticking it out with Lightning Conduit as much as they did with other abilities. 
This could mean more casual players went to Lightning Conduit and more hardcore players went stuff they already knew. Lots of biases available here, but this is what the data indicates. And again, if you think there's a bias here, you're probably right. I'm not saying Lightning Conduit definitely is bad. Again, it got nerfed in the patch, uh, but worth noting. Next uh, most popular skill in SSF Softcore was Righteous Fire. And actually of note that this graph tended to go up into the right up into the early 90s. Now I know Righteous Fire players will often say, hey, there's not a lot of great endgame scaling for RF. Uh, it's you, you only have so many other mods you can add to get more damage. Uh, worth noting that the hexes getting buffed in the in the next patch, where you can lower the resistance of bosses like Cirrus more reliably and give them um, lower fire resist, should help Righteous Fire a bit in endgame bossing. Uh, shouldn't matter a ton for generic mapping overall, but tended to trend upwards. Worth noting that there's only so many characters 95 plus. If I scale back over to how many characters in the cohort are 95 plus, um, there's only 342. Um, so there's only 342 total builds here, and we're tracking like 20-something, um, that made uh, to level 95+, plus, and obviously it goes down and down and down and down, so like not being one of the 7-100s is not a fair condemnation, because there were only 7 of them at this one-week cohort. Anyway, worth noting that Righteous Fire did not seem to push the extreme top end of the game, but generally speaking, also uh, a note is that... Um, the last five levels are going to be just rife with just variants because of how few builds they really were. But RF tended to trend upward even through 95, which is like deep into late reds. Like that is that is an extreme amount of gameplay to get to 95. Um, so like RF seems to hold up pretty well against other juicing characters who are also going for 95 in the first week, which is again a lot of hours. Um, RF does pretty well there. So clearly a very strong leap starter, though maybe, 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 maybe not an extreme late game build, but it's because I also kind of know that. So Spectre Helix got hit really, 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 really hard um, last patch. Um, Spectre Helix got hit really, really, really hard and is probably no longer a build you should be looking to do terribly aggressively. Um, it did trend up to the right forever, it's worth noting. Um, Spectre Helix definitely uh, deserving of the nerf was pretty much the best attack skill in the game. Um, well represented, it was the third most popular skill at 80+, plus, and it trended up to the right at every single level from there, which means even pushing 100 was done well as Spectral Helix. It's worth noting, um, in general, the uh, most Helix players were champions. Uh, there were other ways to play Helix, but champion remained the most popular ascendancy for that build the entire time. We go to Poison Concoction. Poison Concoction has a very similar shape to Spectral Helix. Uh, fourth most popular league starter, and again, up to the right the whole way through. Generally speaking, Occultus ended up being the best performant ascendancy for Poison Concoction. Again, in terms of XP per hour, um, Occultus has continued every single league I've looked at this to overperform Pathfinder in overall mapping power. Now, it's worth noting the, the biases that exist. So uh, let's talk about the fact that your early campaign is likely worse on Occultus than Pathfinder. Pathfinder is closer to the Flask Notes. Pathfinder is closer to the Poison Notes. Pathfinder actually has access to Poison Concoction and Lesser Volley and LMP as a base class, um, as Ranger, and Witch doesn't. Which means uh, the Witch's level experience is going to be a lot slower. Which means it's totally possible that there is a level 79 Poison Concoction Occultist that had a really, really slow run that wasn't accounted here. Um, so, you know, I don't know how many level 1 Witches wanted to go Poison Concoction and gave up want a bad time leveling or whatever, but it's worth noting that in terms of your week one snapshot, like, I think anyone who plays the game a large amount can reach level 80 no matter what you're playing in the campaign, right? It, it's a week, you probably have time for it, um, and so even if Pathfinders get a head start, and that is almost certainly true, day one Pathfinders may end up ahead of um, Occultists, I don't actually know, I didn't look at that to be fair, um, by the first week, Occultists have all taken over. Um, that's the primary analysis that um, if you're looking at longer than one or two days into the game, um, occultists take over Pathfinders definitively um, in XP per hour in terms of a poison concoction ascendancy. So worth noting there. Also worth noting that if you're like, oh, by the way, players probably hop off of poison concoction and they play Blade Blast instead, this doesn't appear to be true. That, you know, someone who only played, let's say, 50 hours and got to level 85, or someone who played 100 hours and got to level 95, um, those that cohort of 95 players doesn't seem to be hopping off of poison concoction very much. They seem to be pretty happy staying with the ability and running it all the way to level 100. Fifth most popular skill is actually summon raging spirits. SSF viable, of course. Worth noting that um, necromancer ended up being the most common ascendancy here for SRS. Uh, does tend to trend downward towards the 90s and 95, so it doesn't seem to push into reds very very well, but holds on pretty strongly. 
and remains a, a pretty decent percentage of the cohort up through 90. Um, so seems to be a pretty viable league starter. Doesn't appear in SSF to have incredibly good late game scaling. Um, that said, keep in mind that minion builds were changed, I think, last patch um, to have much more gear-based scaling. Uh, sorry, gear-based scaling. So if you're playing in a trade league like I'm going to be, um, grabbing minion-based gear from trade uh, can help you out because minion abilities are not terribly popular, right? Here's our first minion ability, and it's the fifth most popular league starter, and it trends downward towards the late 90s. We have Absolution a bunch, uh, or like a lot later down, um, but, you know, SSF doesn't have a ton of minion players, and regardless, again, acquiring probably relatively cheap gear because minions are pretty unpopular on trade. Uh, might actually work out just fine for you, but SRS, right, clearly pushes pretty well. Uh, worth noting that there's a spike here because it's like two of the, I don't know, 20 level 90s, um, or SRS, I made up those numbers, not the right numbers, but, um, you know, has the players who actually did hold on to the pretty late levels, did pretty well. Next up is Explosive Arrow. Um, this is pretty much all Explosive Arrow totems. Um, this was about 50% Elementalist and 50% Champion coming into this one. So, and even though it was Softcore, Champion was, uh, a pretty popular fantasy. About half the 80 pluses were indeed Champion. Um... Uh, what am I trying to say here? That, like, the durability was considered valuable. Obviously, um, in Elementals can have a lot of Ignite damage and, and do pretty well. And this build certainly held up, right? It somewhat trended down towards the mid-90s, but uh, there were a few who did really, really well in the endgame. Um, worth noting that uh, Champions took over at 96+, plus. that around here. Um, the Elementalists had fallen off and the Champions took over. To be fair, there's only a few of these, so it's it's rife with variants. Also, the number one Explosive Arrow Totem was actually a Scion. Scion was the number one Explosive Arrow character this patch. And again, it's SSF. This isn't just like, oh yeah, you know, someone, I mean, it's possible that someone found a sick item and then made a new Scion that got 96 on like day two of the league and, you know, rushed it by the end of the first week. But an Explosive Arrow Scion was actually the best performance uh, week one SSF softcore character. Uh, but again, the build seems to do pretty well, despite the small nerf explosive arrow dot damage. Seems to be pretty good overall and still a very, very viable league starter. Next up, people saying Melee is dead. Bone Shatter actually overperformed. We saw Righteous Fire fall off. We saw SRF fall off. We saw Explosive Arrow fall off. We saw Lightning Condo fall off. Bone Shatter goes up and to the right, baby. Bone Shatter is in. Yes, it's the number seven most popular league starter, but Bone Shatter is in a Slayer 3 to 1 ratio with Juggernaut. Um, 3 to 1 Slayer over Juggernaut had been the ascendancy choice. Um, that's what players tended to go to. That ratio, according to my notes, um, appeared to pretty much maintain throughout, and Bone Shatter was one of, I believe, either 7 or 9 Week 1 Level 100s in Solo Southbound Softcore. Bone Shatter, actually a good League Starter. Those who went SSF Bone Shatter, a melee attack-based build, did well. Now, I know there's a lot of talk around what's happening with strike changes. Uh, the strike range, I know, got harder to, uh, well, went away, but plus one strike got a lot easier. Um, there's, right, I don't, I couldn't tell you convincingly, definitively, if strike skills got better or worse. I'm pretty sure Bone Shatter's a strike skill. If it's not, XD. Um, but it did really, really, really well pre-patch, and I'm guessing it's going to do quite well post-patch, especially with three of the other top performers getting nerfed, that Bone Shatter is going to look even better compared to the competition, and Bone Shatter looks pretty good as an attack-based skill. Next up is Spark. Spark was almost entirely Inquisitor, and what I said before about Inquisitors might be hopping off of Righteous Fire to go make a Spark character once they get enough currency, get enough levels, and get enough whatever. That is entirely possible. Spark tended to trend down into the right, except for the very, very end game, which might mean indeed that that is a viable analysis, um, a, a likely analysis of this data set. Not a guarantee, or it just could be that the, P the players who actually league start Spark are the 200-hour Andes who are pushing to level 95, like 97. It's possible. I don't know. Spark is primarily Inquisitor, uh, just as Righteous Fire was primarily Inquisitor. Um, also keep in mind that like no, level 97, 98, and 9, level 100 data is very suspect and very prone to bias. So there's not a lot you can really say here because, well, one person happened to push level 100 Spark. Doesn't mean it's actually, you know, the best skill out there, but one of seven, 14% push level 100 Spark. Looks pretty good though. Lightning Strike did very, very, very well. This graph goes up and to the right consistently. Um, another skill that seems to be deserving of the nerf. Um, they didn't hit level 100, but they certainly hit level 99 over here. Um, 
Lightning Strike definitely was a very strong one. Of course, Lightning Strike now has fewer projectiles overall, though keep in mind that plus one strike is easier to access, and that certainly matters as well. My opinion is Lightning Strike I don't think is actually as dead as people think. I think the, the, the ability will work with fewer projectiles. Certainly, the clear is slower, but I don't believe you lose literally any boss DPS with fewer projectiles. We'll see what the clear ends up feeling like. I don't know. It could be that... Uh, obviously, Nightblade went down as well, which certainly matters. So, um, maybe, maybe Lightning Strike really is dead. I don't know. But um, regardless... It certainly was a very strong performer, though, because there's nerfs going on with Withering Step and Nightblade's interaction and uh, Lightning Strike directly getting nerfed. You might want to hop off Lightning Strike, and that's totally reasonable. Uh, worth noting, though, that Ascendancy data-wise, Lightning Strike started out as 60% Raider, 27% Champion, 4% Berserker. By level 94+, plus, it was 50, 40, and 10, meaning um, that Raiders tended to not push as well in XP per hour as Champions or Berserkers. And at level 99+, plus, there was one Raider and one Champion each. And when we started at 60% Raider, 27% Champion, right? Two to one Raider, this ended up one Raider, one Champion. So Lightning Strike um, Champion and Lightning Strike Berserker tended to overperform Raider in XP per hour on Lightning Strike. And considering that Raider is all about, oh, I move fast and I get, you know, nearby enemies have uh, elemental exposure and I have, you know, Frenzy Charge Generation or Super Juiced Onslaught or, you know, whatever. I run really, 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 really fast. I'm so cool. Those didn't do better in XP per hour than Champion or Berserker. Berserker has even more damage. Champion has even more defense. So Raider splits the middle and doesn't appear to perform as well as the other two ascendancies. Um, this has been true for the last three analyses as well. Lightning Strike, I think players really should be getting off of Raider um, when playing Lightning Strike. And again, I think there's a decent chance his ability still does work. Next up is Venom Gyre. Uh, Venom Gyre tend to slightly scale up into the right, although as we're getting to more and more unpopular skills, you're going to have more and more chance for variance here. Uh, Venom Gyre didn't make it to level 97 plus in the first week, uh, but overall certainly seems to do pretty well. And again, another attack-based build that completely holds up throughout I mean, solidly into red maps, right? 95 plus is solidly into red maps without dying very much, doing overall pretty well. Um, looking for my notes here and I'm not finding it. Uh, Deadeye was the primary ascendancy. Uh, no surprise there. There wasn't any sleepers who like showed up and was actually suddenly good somewhere else. But Venom Gyre on Deadeye appears to look very good. Um, if you're going to do some kind of poisoning here, keep in mind poisoning got buffed and could look pretty solid overall. Anyway, next up we can go to Blade Vortex, which trended up and to the right. And Blade Vortex, to me, has been my favorite skill in Path of Exile. I played it in Ritual to 98. That's how much I play. My, my best character ever is 98. I'm not I'm not ultra giga hardcore. I, I get to maps. I get to red maps. Sometimes I play really hard and go kill Maven a few times. But um, again, don't trust me in terms of how good the game is and what's good in the game because I don't actually... I'm not that good at the game, actually. Uh, but anyway, Blade Vortex... Um, was 50% uh, Occultist at the beginning of the cohort, 50% Occultist, 20% Trickster, 15% Elementalist, and 5% Assassin. Uh, most of the Occultists, Tricksters, and Assassins are poison-based, though Assassin, of course, can go crit. Elementalist was clearly going to be an Elemental version. Um, but at the end of the day, when you go to 90+, plus, it's just Occultists. Um, 10x Occultists, basically, at this point, uh, at 90+. plus. Um, Occultist has been the way to actually push XP through Blade Vortex. It's purely poison. It's purely using Profane Bloom Explosions. It's juicy. Honestly, it's great. BV is... Poison BV is definitely a thing, and has been a reasonably popular League starter. Now, it's worth noting that you could say, hey, is it possible that this is getting, you know... This is all happening because people are getting off of Poison Concoction and onto Blade Vortex in late levels. Well, we looked at Poison Concoction earlier on, and Poison Concoction also went up into the right. So it's possible that Poison Concoction is just so damn good that it easily pushed level 90, have the players still hop off and play Blade Vortex or Blade Blast, and yet they're still way up here doing amazingly, right? It's like, I don't know, Poison Concoction definitely looks really, really good. Blade Vortex looks really, really good. And again, Poison is getting buffed because the Poison's deal damage faster mastery is getting unbugged to not double reduce your duration. Um, additionally, the fact that Temporal Chains and not Malevolence, the other one, Despair? Sure, I think it's Despair. Uh, both of which are getting buffed in terms of boss DPS, um, in terms of overall boss damage. So uh, Poison builds appear to be absolutely fucking slaying pre-patch and will do even better post-patch and stay tuned because i think even blade blast looks really good so um if you're like i wasn't sure what's gonna rock uh, i know a lot of other content creators already said this but like yo dog poison is lit in this coming patch blade vortex has done really really well in ssf calandra will probably do very very well in the next patch as well we then look at hex blast hex blast came in at 60 percent inquisitor and 40% uh, Occultist. Uh, 
It did not appear to change much over uh, the course of levels, at least not according to my notes, um, but did scale up into the right, just as you get to higher variants with fewer players. The ones who picked Hacks Blast didn't happen to push to level 97, 98, 99, 100, but up into the right. Hexblast is actually very good at pushing through maps, and according to my notes, which doesn't appear to say that Occultus took over the Ascendancy um, calculation, that even Inquisitor Hexblast worked just fine and was a completely viable build to push into late maps there as well, but Hexblast looked really good. Of course, there are some Hexblast changes, so it is not a guarantee that's going to be a good build post-patch, but it certainly looked very, very good pre-patch. We then go down to the next minion build, and Absolution, sadly, has a really, really hard time pushing maps. Absolution just isn't really that great at it. It doesn't have the best AoE. It's got good boss damage. It's very safe. It's very durable. But you compare to other, maybe, like, durable, um, you know, I mean, basically any map you focus build is going to obviously win an XP per hour. Um, bossing, I don't think makes a ton of sense as a very first league starter. I think getting your watchstones and getting currency, and I think your best way of getting currency is honestly XP per hour and blasting through maps in the early game. Maybe that's wrong. That's just my belief. Um, feel free to have your own opinions. Absolution has been long touted as a very good bosser, a very cheap bosser, a very safe bosser, uh, but does not hold up to the other builds we're tracking here in XP per hour. It is a, sh a vanishingly shrinking acceleratingly shrinkingly small portion of the cohort as time goes on. This is not a good XP per hour build here for Absolution. It is 70% Necromancer, 30% Guardian, and that ratio pretty much held up. Blade Blast, yet another poison build that did incredibly, incredibly well. Blade Blast mostly, almost entirely is Occultist, up and to the right, up and to the right, up and to the right. Poison Concoction Occultist, Blade Vortex Occultist, Blade Blast Occultist. I'm playing one of these. I'm, 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 I'm going to tell y'all to play my League Starter. Uh, I didn't invent this, but it, this is very clearly, this is a sign from the heavens that, hey, by the way, the best League Starters next week per hour are really heavily Poison Occultist builds. Now, to be fair... Occultist did lose. Enemies take 10% increased damage and enemies deal 10% less, or sorry, take 10% increased, deal 10% reduced damage. Um, using things like Wither, you're going to have huge amounts of enemies take increased damage anyway. That said, though, you're not using Wither um, when mapping, right? You're not using Wither on random packs. So, by the way, for all of these builds that are using like um, Blasphemy Temp Chains, because we're an Occultist, of course we are, you are doing straight up. 10% less damage while mapping. That definitely matters. Poison's going through faster and decaying faster doesn't matter when white mobs die in one throw and with overkill and poison anyway. The rare mobs, if you're not throwing a wither totem down, maybe they die faster, maybe they die slower based on poison duration being better but also not being affected by malediction until you get a cluster jewel. Um, that can be hard to say. Then when you're fighting bosses, the, the boss damage of these builds is going to be up, but these were builds that were blasting maps really, really hard, and they are going to do about 10% 10 10 less damage per second in most generic mapping scenarios. In general, I think this is probably still going to be more than fine, but also, keep in mind, it's also, they are taking 10% more damage via Malice showing away. Yes, these builds are going to be very, very good, but as you look at the third straight Occultist Poison build and go, oh, these builds are really, really strong, the Lost Malediction does matter, right? You are 10% less tanky, you're doing 10% less damage in many contexts. Now, you might have been overkilling in many cases anyway, but again, until you're throwing down Wither Totems to deal with um, a, a tanky rare, you are going to feel this a fair bit. Um, so... Just a thing I want to bring up that there is a caveat here that there is actually a nerf to all of these builds because of the malediction notable on the Ascendancy getting, well, renamed and, and worse. So keep that in mind. We move on to Sunder, an attack skill that did not hold up nearly as well to things like um, Earth Shatter or Bone Shatter, rather, sorry. Um, Sunder tended to trend a little bit down into the right. No one pushed it really, really hard. Um, Sunder tended to be played as 6% Zerker and 15% Chieftain. Although if you look at the 90 plus cohort, which still held on pretty well, to be fair, still 1.3% of the latter, it was 6% Zerk still, 10% Chieftain, so that went down, but 10% Slayer. So there weren't a lot of level 80 Slayers, there were a lot of level 90 Slayers. So it appears as though Slayers, even with Sunder, actually did quite well in XP per hour. 
and that it might just be that um, you know Slayer is actually low key very very good, and and Slayer Sunder actually seems to work pretty well. But again, there's only so many characters here. Ten percent of a relatively unpopular skill in a relatively small cohort of week one level ninety characters is a pretty small amount of data, and that's prone to a lot of variance. It is possible that Slayer is actually Pog, or just there happen to be three really big Slayer players. Both are reasonable assumptions here. Um, speaking of, of chaos damage builds, though, Bane did not hold on quite as well as other builds. Bane was played as a cultist, primarily, of course, and Bane did not hold up quite so well compared to the other chaos damage builds, the poison builds out of a cultist. So, um, worth noting that this build probably was going down to the right, and with a cultist getting, um, again, direct nerfs via, pro, uh, not profane bloom, but direct nerfs via, um, uh, 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 malediction, the fact that she's already so good at blasting content because she's an occultist and enemies explode. Bane did not hold up an XP per hour. Maybe it's very safe, maybe it's a good bossing ability, I don't know, but Bane did not hold up against the cohort in XP per hour. We then have Wave of Conviction, which generally, as, as we're going to see spikier and spikier graphs as we get to less and less popular abilities, uh, but it generally trends up and to the right until we get really, really low on player numbers. Um, here, I mean, 95 plus is just full spikes. Um, and again, as the abilities get more and more unpopular, you're just going to have these these wild moves. But I think a general up to the right trend, this is Wave of Conviction Ignite. Uh, this is primarily an elementalist build. And honestly, it seems to perform pretty, pretty well, right? Throw Wave of Conviction down, you ignite them, you feel good about it. Uh, the packs die, you have pretty decent clear. And honestly, it seems to hold up pretty well. Um, I don't believe there's any nerfs to this ability or to elementalist or anything. So Wave of Conviction Element uh, Ignite seems to do quite well, seems to be quite strong, and a completely worthy league starter. If you haven't played this yet, you can certainly play it. Next up is Ark in uh, many forms. Ark uh, did not seem to do very, very well. Uh, and a possible explanation of this could be that um, less hardcore players, those who put in fewer hours, tend to play things like Ark. Um, because, you know, I if anyone ever asks me, hey, my first time playing Battle of Exile, what should I play? I tell them to play Ark. Um, I tell them to go look up Enki's Ark Witch build and go play Ark. And so it's entirely possible that there's actually a group of players who, you know, are relative to the game. It's their second league, maybe. They're going to try SSF. Um, they're going to play Ark. And because they only put in so many hours or they're only so skilled at the game, they get to level 83 after a week of play. And, you know, they only have so many hours or whatever or who knows. And so, you know, Ark doesn't tend to do very well in any of these scenarios. This is me inventing a possible reason. This could be entirely inaccurate. Ark could simply have really hard time scaling and just not be there. Uh, as far as the tendency cohort, to bring some things up, Ark was 60% Elementalist and 50% Hierophant at level 80+, plus, and also 10% Inquisitor uh, at all characters 80+. Plus. But if we look at the 90+, plus cohort which is a bit more endgame, it's only 43% Elementalist, it's 22% Hierophant, and it's 13% Inquisitor. So, um, Inquisitors seem to do better compared to Elementalists, Hierophant seem to do better compared to Elementalists. I believe Hierophant Arc is Arc Totems, um, I'm pretty sure that's true. So, Arc Totems appear to perform better than Self-Cast Arc. It's possible that Inquisitor players were jumping off of RF onto Arc as like a level 90, 95 plus build possibility. I'm not really certain on that one. Um, but either way, those tendencies tended to scale up compared to elements that they were a larger portion of arc players in later level scenarios. Next up is Rage Vortex. Uh, Rage Vortex has been touted as a pretty good league starter, and the data really, really strongly supports this. Again, Rage Vortex is like the, I don't know, 17th most popular league starter, so there's only so many players, but this is a very, very strong, obviously up to the right trend. Like, Rage Vortex is performing as well as Poison Concoction. Like, this is functionally a graph of popularity turns into power at, at blasting maps, and Rage Vortex has Poison Concoction, Poison BV, Poison Blade Blast levels of a holy shit, this thing is fucking good. Um, so, right, and this is SSF Softcore um, playing a uh, Berserker, I think? Hold on, let me find it. Yeah, Berserker is the primary sentence here for this one, and, like... They are really, really, really overrepresented at level 95, 96. This is a clear up to the right. Rage Vortex, I think, is Giga Slept On. And it is weird to me. I'm going to stop here and, and go on a, a, a rant for a second. Um, that the subreddit complains at how melee isn't viable. And Rage Vortex is like straight up Blade Blast levels of fucking crushing into the end game. Like, this is, this is Spectral Helix levels, Lightning Strike levels of just scaling up into the right. Rage Vortex is definitively... I mean, I guess if you want to call it not a melee skill, I guess you could, but like, I don't know. Rage Vortex is clearly awesome. Um, Bone Shatter was doing clearly very, very well. That that thing was hitting hard. So Rage Vortex appears to be a very good league starter. Um, 
the fact that so there, there's an interesting thing going on here which is um the changes to like you high level unique weapons is going to be kind of strange because on the one hand a cheap Ari's disfavor even if it's not very strong in trade league is like well there's a whole bunch of pretty good unique two-handers that just are going to be 5c and i can just buy and wear and like this is week one SSF characters, right? Like, these are week one SSF characters who are pushing to, like, level 100 in pretty short amounts of time. Like, getting a normal Ziri Aris' favor and been like, yeah, good enough. This this will carry me to, like, level 96. Like, that helps trade league players, right? Just, like, access to high DPS, high, highly common items. Um, but the other side of that is these are going to be much more rare, but also going to be, like, 900 DPS weapons. Um and in some case, they're going to be just completely freaking absurd, like Void Forge, um, where that, that thing just looks just the most ridiculous item of all time. Um, and it's like, well, in those cases, honestly, this feels like a, a build where, hmm, maybe I can just go this way and, and you know, I'll have more mediocre rares for a while. But like my end game, if I can get the money, is going to be absurd because people are going to drop Star Forges and Void Forges and Disfavors and everything else. And we can play around that with abilities like Rage Vortex and Bone Shatter and, and whatnot, because there are some melee abilities who are performing very, very well. And once you get the currency to get a, a sweet unique, off you go to the races. So real possibility here. Rage Vortex, I think, should really be considered as a league starter, especially in Trade League, where then you can get access to a really sick unique that can just spike your damage into the stratosphere, and then you can crush all content in the game without even your eyes being open. Possibility here. Next up, Eye of Winter did not appear to hold up to other abilities. Of course, we are getting relatively less popular. Uh, my understanding with Eye of Winter builds is they really, really want Snake Pit, the unique ring that does cool things with your projectiles. And an SSF is going to be really hard to find. But like, hey, if you can if you can find one Divine and go buy one um, in Trade League, Eye of Winter might spike towards the end game and actually scale a bit better. But Eye of Winter does not appear to do nearly as well as things like Wave of Conviction or um, other a few of the other elemental abilities that seem to hold on a bit better, like Spark. Um, uh, Eye of Winter was primarily an Inquisitor build. Uh, it was almost entirely running as mines, uh, but Eye of Winter mines did not seem to hold up as well as other elemental builds for the most part. It tended to go down to the right against other builds you could have played, so Eye of Winter does not appear to be a great league starter in that it doesn't really crush late reds as well on low investment. Next up, another poison, well, another chaos build, I should say, is Soul Rend. Soul Rend was 50 50 trickster and occultist, but by 90 plus, it was 2 to 1 occultist. So, um, occultist unsurprisingly, tends to do better than other Ascendancies as they push towards the end game. Soul Rend uh, took over um, as a cultist overplayed uh, Trickster here. That said, again, a cultist is getting nerfed, and if you're not getting buffed by the poison changes, um, this can certainly matter quite a bit there. So um, keep in mind that Soul Rend uh, trended down and to the right. Uh, also, its primary, its best Ascendancy is also getting nerfed, so Soul Rend uh, does not appear to be as good as the other Chaos Damage builds as a League Start. Toxic Rain also tended to trend somewhat down and to the right as well. There's a spike of, you know, one, like, level 97 player who did really well, but for the most part, Toxic Rain, though it, you know, somewhat holds up. Right, 1% of players, though, were level 80+. plus. Um, under five percent, under high percent of players were level 95+. plus. Again, variance here with all the spikes and whatnot, but um, worth noting that the percentage of, of the player base at each level, right, goes down. Um, Toxic Rain started as 40% Trickster. And 30% Raider, 10% Champion, and 10% Pathfinder uh, at the 80 plus cohort. But by the time we got to uh, late game, uh, 90 plus cohort, it was uh, Raider overtook Trickster in terms of performance, and Pathfinder overtook Champion. So um, in terms of XP per hour, Pathfinder appears to beat out Champion, and Raider appears to beat out Trickster. Um, in general, the ones who fell down were less and less of the cohort, but the ones moved up. Um, although Trickster was still the second most popular um, Pantheon by level 90 plus. Uh, but in general, um, Raiders and Pathfinders, basically the Ranger subclasses tended to outperform uh, the other two subclasses. So uh, worth considering that if you want, do want to start out Toxic Rain, um, some of this this decay is to like improper or like incorrect um, ascendancy choices where like, you know, there probably is a most powerful version of Toxic Rain and it's more likely to be Raider and Pathfinder than it is to be Trickster or Champion. So Toxic Rain would look different with different ascendancy choices, I'm pretty sure. We move on to Vortex. Vortex, good old Cold Dot. Good old cold dot. It's all the cold dots. You put them all together. Vortex, actually a pretty good league starter. Um, 
The Vortex ended up being 55% Elementalist and 33% Occultist at the level 80 cohort. This ended up being almost all Elementalist as we moved toward endgame. So Elementalist Vortex appears to be outperforming Occultist Vortex. So even though Malediction is getting nerfed, even though Occultist had um, explosions... Elementalist appeared to outperform Occultist in this uh, world, and with the nerfs, I think it's very clear that we should all be going, if you're going to go for Cold Dot, um, you indeed can push levels pretty well. Um, I know it's called a safe botter, uh, sorry, a safe bosser. It's not typically called a fast mapper, and yet Cold Dot Elementalist Vortex appeared to, generally speaking, outperform the other builds in terms of XP per hour. Um, generally speaking, Vortex going up to the right means that, hey, it wasn't very popular at Leakstar. Only 1% of people who made 80 plus and got a 5 league were playing Vortex, but of those who made 95, 2.5%, right? 2.5x popularity. Um, Cold Dot might, again, only, uh, you know, we talk about possible biases. It might be that, you know, the really hardcore players who play that all hours, the ones who actually play Cold Dot. Um, and so, of course, they're going to 95. That's a possibility here, but. It does appear to do very well, even in a pure XP per hour calculation. So this could be, well, they don't die as much. And XP per hour is not loot per hour, right? If you kill 10 maps and then die, and then kill 10 maps, then die, then kill 10 maps, then die, and the Vortex player kills 35 maps without dying, but much more slowly, they're pro they might beat you in XP per hour, but not in loot per hour. So a possibility there, a thing to keep in mind. So the Elementals appears to be very pog for that one. Next up, we have Shield Crush. Um, Shield Crush also actually doing pretty well here, worth noting, in XP per hour. Shield Crush looking pretty solid. 30% um, Gladiator, 30% Slayer, 15% Trickster at the first bit of the cohort. Um, this turned into 40% Gladiator. So Gladiator actually was a bigger portion of Shield Crush. Uh, Slayer went down, and Trickster remained about equal. So Gladiator Shield Crush appears to be the best performing version of this build. Um... Trickster is a maybe, though I doubt it, but Gladiator appeared to do very, very well. And again, this build is somewhat up to the right, although this is all variance land, so not a guarantee that it's actually going to be the kind of build that pushes you to 100. Uh, but despite being relatively unpopular, seems to have a pretty good share of players in the, in the mid-90s. We move on to Explosive Trap. Uh, we'll just kind of scroll up a bit here, and, and we'll leave those those things for a bit later. Explosive Trap was a um, big saboteur ability, of course, and, um, you know, wasn't terribly popular. The graph is funky because it turns out that there was a level, I think, 98 or 99 Explosive Trap player, so it makes the graph look like this. That said, it did somewhat trend, maybe, up into the right possibility, maybe, kind of. Uh, hard to say. Explosive Trap certainly seems to function. It seems to be a completely playable, viable, passable Um you know, mapping build, saboteur build, Explosive Trap appears to be pretty solid. So, hey, consider it. Explosive Trap seems to be a build if you want to try it. Seems to be okay. Next up, Kinetic Blast, which is primarily a application of Corrupting Fever. This is almost entirely Gladiator. It did somewhat trend down to the right, although it does hold on for a good amount of time. Um, again, variants with an unpopular build. We're only looking at 0.7% of the meta. There's not a lot of those out there. Um, so, hey... It's not a ton. Uh, I did point out earlier that the number one uh, Corrupting Fever build was a Scion, although for the most part, um, Gladiator did tend to do pretty well in this case. Uh, or was it Gladiator? Sorry, let me look at my notes again. Uh, Gladiator. Yeah, Gladiator, Corrupting Fever, Connected Blast. Um, I mean, honestly, seems to be decent, to be clear. Seems to be decent, but maybe it's not super top end, but it seems to do pretty well into, into at least mid-90s for the most part. Uh, well, some people wanted to bravely start Lightning Arrow. Lightning Arrow did not hold up very well compared to other attack-based builds. Sadly, bow builds um, do not appear to be very, very good. Um, and other than running Explosive Arrow Totems, which I don't think counts as a bow build, really. Um, sadly, there don't appear to be really any good bow league starters that I can see, that I can identify. Um, Lightning Arrow was 85% Deadeye. There were some Tricksters. No matter what you pick, they didn't really seem to overperform. You didn't get a whole lot done. Said the Lightning Arrow, not really a great league starter. It does seem to fall off. Scaling might be good, but the early game doesn't seem to be there for the first week. Lightning Trap also tended to fall off pretty strong here. Saboteur, the primary node here. Uh, but yeah, Lightning Trap, Sabo didn't seem to do a whole lot. Um, didn't seem to be all that strong. Didn't get a whole lot done there. Um, worth noting that very few people actually seem to start Seismic Trap as far as I could tell because I didn't see it anywhere on these graphs. And so that was the next most popular build of, you know, 0.7% of the pick rate. Off we went. Okay, so that's the League Start build analysis, right? And we can do a little bit to try to unpack a little bit of the biases here to see if players are shifting their builds around a little bit. Is there anything going on here? Um, also, which ascendancies tended to do well? Of course, there's a lot of overlap here with what ascendancy is good and what abilities are good. But let's talk about ascendancy performance here. We get new colors here. Hopefully it looks cool. Elementalists were the most popular 
ascendancy in the game. Um, there's a uh, couple of weird things going on here. It's it's hard to explain. So, um, because not every level 80 character in SSF has a 5 link yet, the like percentage of builds that are tracked is low at 80 and then more accurate at 90. Um, and so it's like, well, 57% of elementalists level 80 were running lightning conduit 5 link and 70% of those at level 90 were running lightning conduit as a 5 link. Um, but that could just be those lightning conduit players basically catching a 5 link, not lightning conduit overperforming and going up to the right, but uh, which makes this tough. Basically, anything where the numbers are 25% higher is roughly the math, um, tends to be actually flat. But anyway, um, Elementalist is largely a graph of lightning conduit players. 70% of this part onwards are all lightning conduit. So this this decay is lightning conduit's decay primarily, which which was which was indeed decaying. Um, Inquisitor, we go from 46% of this being righteous fire to 63% of this being righteous fire. So in general, the idea of people are hopping off of RF to go play other builds doesn't appear to be supported in general. That RF is actually a bigger cohort of the high-level Inquisitors than before, which means if we go back and look at things like maybe Spark Inquisitor um, or even Arc Inquisitor, uh, is it, where is, where is Spark? Where, where is Spark? Where is Spark? Here's Spark. So Spark going up to the right does not appear to be Inquisitors hopping off of RF. And RF going down um, here does not appear to be Inquisitors hopping off of RF. Because more and more of the Inquisitors are actually RF builds um, heading into uh, the endgame. Inquisitor tends to fall off a little bit with levels. To be fair, again, Inquisitors are mostly playing Righteous Fire. And Righteous Fire does not seem to be amazing at pushing 97s according to this data. There could be biases. You tell me. Either way, it's what's been happening. Occultist is our first up into the right Ascendancy. No one is surprised. Ascendancy is very, very good, especially at blasting maps. Profane Bloom is amazing. And so Occultists really did a really good job at getting up here. Now, of note, Occultist goes from being 24% Poison Concoction to being 29% Poison Concoction here. Um, one of the healthiest, highest variants um, Ascendancies out here, right? Blade Vortex, Blade Blast, uh, Bane, all, all those Chaos abilities, basically, even some, some Cold Dot. But on average, Occultists went from 10% of the ladder at level 80 to being 25% of the ladder at level 100, or even being 50% of the ladder at 95. Occultists definitely, I think, deserving of a nerf. They were absolutely blasting maps in terms of um, getting through XP per hour and, and getting through stuff. So indeed, there's a cultist. And yep, this is going to be my ascendancy. Of note also, though, is Champion did very, very well. Champion was only 7% of all level 80 characters and ended up being over 11% of 95s. And it was actually... 25% of level 100s. Um, Champion did really, really, really well. Uh, now, this was 40% Spectral Helix. This was 47% Spectral Helix. Now, Spectral Helix got a gigantic nerf. A gigantic nerf. Um, but less than half of Champions were Spectral Helix. There are other builds out there that Champions can run. And unless it's getting entirely carried by Helix, which I doubt, um, then I think Champion seems to be a very good ascendancy for pushing XP per hour overall and finding other builds to play. But there's a lot of other tackles you can go for with Champions. Uh, Totems as well, of course, can exist. So here is Trickster. Of course, a lot of people tried Trickster. I think um, anything where you get a rework to an Ascendancy, I think you tend to flock in players who want to try the new thing. Uh, it is very easy to assume that this is going to have a bias of people try stuff out. They get to yellows and go, eh, it's not for me. Have the character play a new character. It is very easy to explain away or to try to explain away, uh, Trickster having a fall-off uh, scenario here, or Trickster really just isn't that powerful in terms of late-game red map scenarios where other Ascendancies who are more powerful overtake Tricksters. It's a possibility, certainly. 16% um, of Tricksters here were Lightning Conduit, 25% 20, uh, of Tricksters here were Lightning Conduit, 11% becomes 15% for Spectral Helix, 7% becomes 7% for Blade Vortex. So Blade Vortex Trickster did not appear to overrepresent, but Conduit and Helix did from 80 to 90. Next up, we have Necromancer, which also went down to the right a little bit. Um, minion builds definitely do not appear to be the best at blasting maps. I think I think I think minions are almost never outside of um, Spectres. Going to be really great map blasting builds, from what I can tell. Um, this was twenty. This was forty eight percent summon raging spirits, which became sixty seven percent summon raging spirits here at ninety plus. Um, uh, Absolution went from twelve percent to fourteen percent. Generally speaking, this means Absolution did not hold up in XP per hour, which we already knew, and the SRS tended to do okay at holding up in XP per hour. Um, trust me on that one. But 
of linear macromancers. This is almost entirely now a graph of SRS, which is going to look a lot very similar to the graph of SRS, which again fell off into the right. Slayer, generally speaking, performed very, very well. Slayers overall had very good XP per hour metrics up into the right for a very long time until you get sort of later on to the end game where there's just only so many characters out there and you get variants and indeed no Slayers made it to level 98. Um, that said, um, Slayers were 64 to 79% Bone Shatter. So this graph is basically a graph of Bone Shatter. And again, Slayer Bone Shatter did very, very well. But we saw a couple of other cases of builds that did well with Slayer. Um, I'm trying to think of the one. I think it was... What are the other attack builds? I don't remember exactly. It's in my notes somewhere. Oh, it was uh, Sunder. Slayer Sunder also seemed to do pretty well of note. So um, Slayers appear to be a pretty good ascendancy for XP per hour, uh, for crushing maps and whatnot, and not dying while doing so. And there are a few attack builds that appear to work pretty well for them. Um, Dead Eyes mostly held up. This is, again, going to be pretty similarly just a, a graph of Venom Gyre. 50% uh, at 8, 80+, 60% at 90+. Plus. Um, keep in mind that a lot of characters didn't have 5 links, so a lot of 80 plus Dead Eyes were on 4 link Gyre, and then finally, then the ones who were at 90 were on 5 link Gyre or 6 link Gyre. Um, but again, slightly up into the right. Dead Eyes do appear to work pretty well. Um, it may not be a bow based build, at least you get an attack range based build. So, you know, if you are a range DPS kind of player, Venom Gyre Dead Eye appears to be in a pretty good spot and certainly worth playing, though you're not going to hold a bow. It's going to feel a little similar. Raiders tended to be a pretty flat ascendancy overall. We're learning that you can now scale buff effect to scale onslaught. I don't know if that actually helps or hurts Raiders because um, Raider, Raiders getting perma onslaught um, means that they don't get to do flask effect buffs to make their silver flask good. So that might be a nerf to Raider or it might be that you just get generic buff effect to scale with your generic I have onslaught. And it's fine. So, like, you don't get this flask effect scaling, but you can get buff effect scaling, and maybe that's good enough. I don't know. Um, either way, there are changes to Onslaught, because Onslaught is going to be scaled buff effect. And if it's a flask, a silver flask is going to scale as flask effect, and we'll see what happens out of that one. Either way, though, um, Raider is here and seems to be relatively flat. It went from 41 to 54% Lightning Strike. Again, Lightning Strike is getting nerfed. Um, it went from 30 to 29% Spectral Helix. Spectral Helix is getting nerfed. Again, Raider Helix did not appear to do very, very well in the first place anyway. That could easily just be that they were switching to Lightning Strike later on in the build. I don't know. Regardless, though, Lightning Strike and Helix are both going down. We'll see if Raider has its own home afterwards. Um, it does appear that Raider was one of the better homes for um, Toxic Rain. So keep that in mind as a real possibility. Pathfinder, up and to the right. Uh, well, it's actually down to the right with a dip because there happened to be boss pushers or high-level characters who played Pathfinder. Uh, Pathfinder was 70% to 80% Poison Concoction. Um, but when we saw Occultist and the Poison Concoction line graph overall, all went up to the right. Um, for Pathfinder, it is going down to the right. Generally speaking, does not appear to be a fast enough mapper to hold up with other early characters, but does appear to have the ability to juice really, really hard. Um, people have said that Pathfinder Poison Concoction is a better bosser than Occultist. That is probably true. I don't actually know, but I assume it's true. Um, and um, certainly, you can go level 100 because someone did in a week as one of the uh, what, seven or so uh, level 100 characters, or nine level 100 characters at the end of this one. Guardian did not do so well overall. Guardian were primarily playing summoner builds, so 60% of Guardians were SRS, 72% uh, of Guardians were SRS over here, and this graph kind of follows the SRS graph, which is the same graph, basically. Guardians were all S were, were all um, SRS players, summoner raging spirit, so not much more to say here, because there weren't a lot of other Guardian builds. Some absolution, of course, but not a ton. Berserkers tended to do pretty well. Um, the cries of Melee being dead appear to be wrong. Berserkers tended to go up and to the right and did really, really well for themselves. Uh, Berserkers, 41% Rage Vortex became 58% Rage Vortex. So we are, again, mostly just graphing Rage Vortex, but 26 25% became Sunder, and 16 to 31% became Bladestorm. So Bladestorm was not tracked as its own individual ability, but as we look at cohort of level 90 plus players, well, you know, 2.5% of the latter of 90 plus is Berserker, and 30% of those characters is Bladestorm. So about 1% of the 90 plus ladder is Bladestorm, and about 2% of the 90 plus ladder is Rage Vortex. Um, as a relatively unpopular league start in both cases, both those abilities are doing really, really well. You can see they even pushed 96 pretty uh, pretty solidly here, and, and Berserker was, like, you know, one of the, like, 20 or 60 or whatever uh, level 96 characters at the end of one week. Um, so, yeah, again, I can shout out the fact that 
It looks like Berserker is doing pretty well, um, Slayer is doing pretty well, and Rage Vortex and Bladestorm appear to be doing pretty well, according to the data. Sepatoras did not do the most absurd stuff pushing XP per hour, remained relatively flat at about 2.1%. Of course, there were some pretty weak Sepator builds, like Ice Trap didn't look very good, but Explosive Trap looked pretty good. Um, overall, uh, 23 to 25% were Explosive in this cohort, 26 to 25, or sorry, um, 18 to 26 were Seismic. 20% was Lightning, pretty flat. 14% was Ice Trap, pretty flat. Uh, Seismic Trap does overrepresent as we get later on into the build. Um, it goes from being um, even less popular than Lightning Trap here, um, Seismic, but it does become one quarter of all uh, Saboteurs. Um, so yes, uh, unsurprisingly, Seismic is actually still a pretty good skill. Um, of Saboteur builds, it appears to be the best performing Saboteur build. Um, if we're saying, okay, well, it's, you know, Explosive Trap, and then Lightning Trap, and then Seismic Trap, and then Ice Trap, it is popularity. And then you go into Performance at 90+, plus, and it's Seismic 1, Explosive 2, Lightning 3, Ice 4. So Seismic, yeah, probably still the best Saboteur build, um, though Explosive seems to be decent in and of itself. This one I forgot to put the thing on. Uh, whoops, I didn't put a title. Let me, uh, let me see. What was after Saboteur and before Gladiator? Uh... Juggernaut. Thick jug. All right. I'm... We're inting a little bit. Hang on. Here we go. Juggernauts. Juggernauts appeared relatively flat. It happened to be that there were some Juggernauts who pushed level 100, but for the most part, Juggernaut... Oh, I could have done this. I could have just hovered the thing and Juggernaut was at 2%. Uh, we're not... We're not... We're not the smartest, okay? Um, but yeah, about 2% of the ladder was Juggernauts. That remained relatively flat throughout most of life. Um, you know, a couple of spikes up and down, but... Hey, they have to, again, be a level 100 Juggernaut out there, which is kind of cute. Um, juggernauts were primarily being used to play Bone Shatter. 42% of Juggernauts were 5-link Bone Shatter, and 6% of Juggernauts were 5-link Bone Shatter at 90. Um, ultimately, appears to be a pretty solid build, appears to be pretty good. And so, hey, Juggernaut Bone Shatter uh, seems solid and is playable. We move on to Gladiator. Gladiator is somewhat down to the right, although some people push a little bit hard, but generally speaking, Gladiator builds did not tend to hold up. Again, we're measuring a lot of the same data and, you know, just kind of going back and forth. Gladiators um, tended to be um, 25 to 30% Kinetic Blast, which was Corrupting Fever. 15 to 20% were Spectral Shield Throw, and then 12 to 20% were actually Shield Crush. So Shield Crush is one of the abilities that appeared to go up into the right, that appeared to actually do pretty well. We can go look back at that one again. Um, because I want to make sure that it was right. Yep, Shield Crush tended to go up into the right. And the best performing sentency was indeed Gladiator in that regard. As so we can go back to looking at Gladiator. And yeah, I think Shield Crush, Shield Crush Gladiator appears to be a pretty playable build. Um, though the other ones didn't seem to hold on quite as well. Shield Throw and Kinetic Blast we saw, which is Corrupting Fever. Didn't seem to do all that well overall. Um, Hierophants had a lot of different builds going on. Uh, I mentioned the possibility of them being Arc Totems. They were a decent portion of the Arc players out there before. Um, but Hierophants, in general, did not seem to hold on very well, despite Totems being a pretty safe playstyle, despite having generally pretty good coverage for map clear. Um, Hierophants did not appear to have anything too special going on for them. Tennessee did not seem to have any big winning builds that really took over and overperformed in the endgame. We can scroll down to Ascendant. Ascendants, uh, weirdly enough, not the least popular league start in SSF, but, um, you know, just kind of sat there at about 1% of the ladder, Four pinners the entire time. Um, there we go. Yeah, 1% of the ladder, four pinners the entire time. Happened to be a pretty high-level Ascendant here. This was, I think, the level 98 or 97 um, Corrupting Fever Ascendant out there that did pretty well. Uh, but there were a lot of different Ascendant builds. There's no there's no one build there. Not much to look at there. We can look at Assassin, though. Assassin also um, actually held on reasonably well of note. Um, 34 to 50% of the Assassin at 50+, plus um, ended up being Spectral Helix. 11% of League Start Assassins were Blade Vortex. Um, of course, Spectral Helix didn't really heavily means, you know, the whole Night Blade, um, Scaling Shenanigans, bla and, and just, I mean, Blade Vortex, or sorry, uh, Helix itself being heavily, heavily nerfed. Um, Assassin may not have any builds that it really likes to play right now, as this one may just be um, out of the game for a little while. Unlucky, but maybe it's a goodbye to Assassin for a bit. Uh, we have Chieftain, finally, which also tended to uh, not do super duper well. Uh, tended to also be a down to the right ascendancy. Didn't get a whole lot done. And unfortunately, a pretty unpopular ascendancy. So that's the look there at um, which ascendancies did well, which ones didn't. Let's zoom out a bit here. And let's try to point out some of these starters that I think will be incredibly good based on seeing the numbers go up and to the right. Let's zoom in a little bit more. Something like that. I think this is going to be readable for most players. So in general, Righteous Fire. Anything that, anything that trends up to the right from 80 to 95 is going to probably be a pretty good looking skill 
uh, for a league start for just getting through stuff pretty rapidly. So Righteous Fire tends to get up at the right. Maybe has problems with Ultra Endgame or the players Righteous Fire don't play. Really, really, really long in the league. But Righteous Fire looks like a pretty good start. And um, a mix of uh, Inquisitor and Juggernaut probably going to look pretty solid on this build. I think it's very, very playable. You can always hop off of RF into something like Spark with Inquisitor and that look pretty good. Spiritual Helix got nerfed. I cannot recommend it. Poison Concoction looks very, very good. And I can once again recommend that you play Occultus with Poison Concoction. Subject Experience does not appear to scale very well. Explosive Arrow seems okay. Bone Shatter Juggernaut appears to look very, very good. I think it's a very reasonable play. Um, Spark Inquisitor is a pretty hard sell because it is pretty hard to push into the end game unless you are really, really putting in a lot of hours. Does not appear to be a great league start unless you can get some extra currency or you convert a Righteous Fire character over or something else like that. Um, uh, but doesn't appear to have the best time, um, you know, sustaining through red maps is, is my read on this data. Lightning Strike, of course, got nerfed, but might still look really, really good. This craft looks very, very strong for Lightning Strike. It might still be completely okay to go for. Venom Gyre appears to be a completely solid League Start attack-based build, um, even though people can say that it, it can look really expensive. And to be fair, Venom Gyre is losing some power in terms of um, Nightblade and uh, Elusive Effect and Withering Step interactions getting worse. Venom Gyre probably still holds up, although because there is a nerf, you might consider not doing it. Um, Venom Gyre, maybe not the play. I don't know. We'll see, but on a Deadeye. Blade Vortex, primarily on Occultist, looks amazing. Poison, BV, Occultist appears to be a big winner and is probably going to be great. Hex Blast uh, on either Inquisitor or Elementalist, I believe. Yes, uh, sorry, Inquisitor or Occultist. Uh, unless I miswrote my notes, um, Hex Blast appears to be really, really strong, though Hex Blast is getting changes in the new patch, and so there is some risk here. Absolution does not clear maps very quickly. Blade Blast, another Occultist uh, specialty. Poison Blade Blast looks amazing and looks to be a very, very good option and is most likely going to be my League Starter, that or Blade Vortex. Sunder um, doesn't appear to hold on very well, although with an asterisk, it seems as though Slayer Sunder may actually look very, very good, but data is limited. Bane does not appear to look very good either, and Occultus is getting directly nerfed. Wave of Conviction Elementals looks to be pretty solid and completely a viable League Starter. Generally scales a little bit up into the right to about level 92. Um, Arc does not appear to be a great League Starter. Rage Vortex looks pretty incredible overall as a uh, Berserker. Up into the right, this is one of the most promising graphs I have seen. Rage Vortex should be... Sh I think Rage Vortex should be considered an S-tier League Starter. I think. And with the new, fun, unique weapons coming in, I think Rage Vortex should be considered an S-tier League Starter and is probably my backup League Starter if I'm not going to be playing Occultist. If, like, the Malediction changes are really, really suck for some reason, Rage Vortex looks to be the play. Eye of Winter Mines and Inquisitor does not appear to be doing all that well, unfortunately. It's probably a decent build, but not quite that strong, at least for SSF standards. Soul Red does not appear to be holding up very well either, and keep in mind Occultist got nerfed. Toxic Rain is pretty middling to somewhat down. That said, Pathfinder and Ranger appear to be the best performing versions of Toxic Rain, and maybe consider that if you do want to play Toxic Rain, look for one of the Ranger Ascendancies. Vortex appears to look very, very good, and data indicates that Elementalist is the best version of Vortex, considering that Occultist is also getting nerfed. I think just playing Elementalist Ignite Vortex just is the play. Enjoy scaling your Dot Multi, enjoy scaling your Ignite Vortex, and go have fun. This looks really, really good. Cold dot, occult, sorry, Cold dot Elementalist appears to be a very, very good build in SSF XP per hour, which generally translates pretty well to blasting maps. Shield Crush, especially on Gladiator. Double checking that it is indeed Gladiator. Yeah, Shield Crush Gladiator appears to be a very, very good league start. Um, maybe not really an S tier one, but certainly one that should be considered strong and I think a very viable option. Explosive Trap Saboteur appears to be completely fine and playable. That said, um, the only other trap build that seems good is, shockingly, Seismic Trap Saboteur. It's probably the best trap build in the game right now, at least for saboteurs, so definitely a real possibility there. Kinetic Blast is really just Corrupting Fever. Um, primarily has been played as Gladiator. That said, the best performing Kinetic Blast character was actually a um, Ascendant, so maybe you want to go for it that way. I don't know. This was SSF Softcore Ladder, uh, but Kinetic Blast, Corrupting Fever seems to be okay. Lightning Arrow appears to be bad. Lightning Trap appears to be pretty bad as well. So there's the rundown of what I think are good league starters. There's the generic tier list, not written down anywhere, but hopefully, you know, it seems pretty good for y'all as well. So um, there's my rundown on 3.20 league starters. I think the big winners are Poison Occultist builds, Elementalist Cold Dot, and Rage Vortex, and Bone Shatter. That is my top four. That's my top four. Those are my top four builds. 
Um, one of them is three builds, because Poison Concoction, BV, and Blade Blast are all very good, but they're easily to convert. They're pretty easy to convert one another. There's different passageways for, for uh, Poison Concoction, but um, yeah, I think there's three Occultists, an Elementalist, and a uh, Berserker. Uh, and a Juggernaut are are the, the the big builds basically. I think those are those are the cool ones. Um, but hey, whatever you want to do is whatever you want to do. If you think there's bias in the data, you're probably right. Hopefully you enjoyed the video. Thanks for watching. Bye bye.